Were the vines better than Nirvana? For a few months in 2002, it felt like it. And I must confess, as a died in the world 2000s kid, it's a hill I'm still willing to die on. The enemy breathlessly described Highly Evolved as the greatest debut album ever made, and the anointed frontman Craig Nichols as the new voice of a generation. They put him on a pedestal so high that their coverage took on an almost religious fervour, as this slightly cringeworthy passage shows. Nichols is born of the same gene pool that spawned past greats like Jim Morrison, John Lydon and Kurt Cobain. These are artists who by some Faustian deal rose up above the pack to mean something to their generations beyond the ephemeral appeal of stardom. But beyond the frothing hype, their music, particularly in the early half of the decade, was genuinely brilliant. They welded melodic Beatles-esque melodies with a punky raw edge, and singles like Get Free, Ride and Out of the Way repelled the vines from Australia into worldwide stardom. But as quick as their ascent was, their downfall was swift and brutal. Nichols' mental health and an undiagnosed Asperger's condition were exploited by a cruel music press who was seemingly willing him to suffer the same dark fate as Kurt Cobain. This is the story about the rise and fall of the Vines. Craig Nichols grew up in an affluent Sydney suburb and was an introverted and borderline obsessive teenager who escaped into art, songwriting and skateboarding. He met future Vines bassist Patrick Matthews in the early 90s whilst they were both flipping burgers together at McDonald's. They bonded over music and along with school friend David Olive formed the Vines in 1994, playing their first gig at a friend's 18th birthday party, performing covers by Nirvana and Australian power pop band UMI. They played sporadically throughout the 1990s around Sydney before recording their first demos in 1999. In the Jungle was played on local radio in Sydney and caught the ear of Ivy League Records, who encouraged them to produce a longer 19-track demo in 2001. Buzz followed the release of the Scar-influenced single Factory in November 2001, which washed up on the shores of the UK, where it received Single of the Week in influential weekly music magazine The NME. The demos also found their way to American Rob Schnapp, who produced classic 90s alternative albums from the likes of Beck and Elliot Smith. Schnapp said, I liked that the demo was both melodic and snotty. It had an attitude and was very exciting and visceral. The Vines moved to LA to record their debut album, with the planned eight-week session eventually extended into a torturous six months due to Nichols' perfectionism. But it was clear they were onto a winner, with almost every alternative and major label worth their salt at the time circling. They signed to Heavenly Records in the UK in December 2001 and EMI in Australia in April 2002. For the American market, they were snapped up by major label Capital. For a debut record, Highly Evolved were both accomplished and fully formed. Ballads like Homesick and Autumn Shade were complemented by straight at rockers like Get Free and Ain't No Room. With the Strokes and the White Stripes blowing up the year before, there was a feeling that 2002 it was the Vines' turn to shine. Reviews were nearly all glowing, with The Guardian writing. Highly Evolved is a remarkably confident debut. Like Oasis's Definitely Maybe, it essentially offers two kinds of song, raw-throated rock stomp and swaying ballads, but pulls off both with enviable panache. The first single off the album, Highly Evolved, clocked in at just over a minute and a half. It was a perfect mission statement and charted at number 32, with the enemy making it the single of the week and describing it as scorched, ragged and super heavy. They said, it takes Bleacher and Nirvana as its starting point and then proceeds to compress the whole of Kurt Cobain's career into a blistering minute and a half. It's a totally brilliant record. The Vines toured Europe relentlessly during 2002, including performing at a show in Manchester that was attended by a 16 year old Alex Turner said his own on-stage demeanour with the Arctic Monkeys was inspired by Nichols' spaced out stage presence. Behind the scenes, Nichols had become an industrious cannabis smoker, using the drug to self-medicate and as an escape from the pressures of his newfound fame. It led to some erratic and unpredictable live shows that were lapped up in the enemy, 
with some descriptions that are pretty distasteful by today's standards. One report says Craig throws tantrums that are as funny as they are unexpected and unnerving. Headlines included the vines crack up, an enemy journo terrorised by mental Craig. Another article irresponsibly quotes Craig saying, if anyone else asks me if I'm suicidal, I think I'll kill myself. The Kurt Cobain comparisons were uncomfortable, but they nevertheless continued to glamorise suicide and commodify his fragile mental health. According to setlist.com, the Vines went all over the world to play a massive 89 shows in 2002. For EMI and Capital, it paid to have an edgy, unpredictable frontman able to recruit their investment into the band, despite the obvious signs that his mental state was deteriorating with every show. There were several breaking points, including in early 2003, when they were booted off the Jay Leno chat show in America after Craig wrecked the set during rehearsals. Then at a show in Boston, Craig attacked bassist Patrick, which saw the tour cancelled. The music press continued to make light of the developments, and the NME featured a comedy interview with TV hypnotist Paul McKenna about how to cure Craig and his problems. Journalists were now more interested in the so-called rock and roll antics of the Vines than the actual music, which had become a sideshow. The Vines returned with second record Winning Days in 2004. It was again recorded with Rob Schnapp, and the tracklist was mostly culled from songs written at the same time as Highly Evolved. The title track was a standout with its sweet, lilting 60s influence. For critics, the album was a disappointing rehash of the debut. Reviewing a live show in 2004, The Guardian said, Perhaps it's because we've now got the Libertines for Passion Disarray and the Kings of Leon for Thrasher About Joy that the Vines sound clinical. Even Nichols' theatrics are tired. He jumps, staggers and fights with his guitar, but his passionate yells have turned into parody. As Nichols hits his head with his microphone and gurns yet again, you can't help feeling that the Vines' moment has passed. Things reached a disastrous low point in May 2004, when the Vines played a hometown show at Sydney's Annandale Hotel, sponsored by Triple M Radio, with an audience consisting of competition winners and music industry hangers-on. Nichols berated the audience and said, Why the fuck are you laughing? You're all a bunch of sheep! Before proceeding to smash a camera of a photographer and storm off stage. Years of this sort of destructive behaviour had built up, but it was always dismissed as rock and roll or attention seeking by the music press and his own label, who seemingly showed no duty of care to Craig and collectively failed to ask if something deeper was going on. Then a perceptive friend intervened. It was Craig's guitar technician Tony Bateman who had seen his share of rock and rollers as he'd worked with bands in the UK for decades. He suggested Craig had a natural neurological problem and hypothesised it was Asperger's syndrome. It's a form of autism that affects how people behave, see and understand the world and interact with others. Studies have found people with Asperger's are also nine times more susceptible to suicidal thoughts, which makes the enemy's descriptions of Craig and the references to Kurt Cobain even more distasteful. Craig stood trial for assaulting a photographer in Australia when psychologist Dr Tony Atwood, who was a specialist in Asperger's, was brought in for the defence as an expert witness. He confirmed that Craig was on the autism spectrum and said that the condition goes some way to rationalising the complete communication that could occur between Nichols and journalists. He said that after performing, Nichols suffered from sensory overload and physically lashed out as a result. The court agreed that he did not intend to hurt the photographer, he just couldn't bear her intrusion into his personal space. Assault charges were dropped. Craig said he was relieved at finally being able to make sense of his life after the diagnosis. While growing up, his obsessive and reclusive behaviour concerned his parents enough that they took him to see a psychologist at age 15, but no mention of autism had ever been made. Though he wasn't just another messed up rock star or an accident waiting to happen, he was neurodivergent. Dr Atwood also said his marijuana intake had worsened the effects of his condition and he ordered the singer to curtail his touring, create a recording studio in his home, improve his diet and stop smoking weed. 
By 2006, the Vines' manager Andy Kelly was expressing guilt about the demands the music machine had put on a clearly vulnerable person. He really was in pain, it was awful to watch. I used to sometimes think, are we going to be the end of Craig? We love him, and yet, we're killing him. Why are we making him go on tour when it clearly makes him so unhappy? The Vines released third record, Vision Valley, in 2006, which was the first without Matthews, who had quit after another fallout with Craig. By 2008, his mental health had deteriorated again, and shows in Australia and Japan were cancelled so he could receive immediate clinical help. The NME, seemingly oblivious of their own effect on his mental condition, issued an apology about how wrong they were for hyping the band in the early 2000s. In a cruel review of their fourth album, 2008's Melodia, a journalist pompously said that the Vines were never the saviours of rock and roll they said they'd be. The Vines continued to put out new music, including 2011's Future Primitive, 2014's Wicked Nature, and 2018's In Miracle Land. None of these reinvented the wheel, but they included more 60s psychedelic-inspired influences. My favourite song from this era was Metal Zone from Wicked Nature, which sounds like a grunge lost classic, and Craig rolls back the years with a trademark roar straight out of 2002. And it's got 12 million plays on Spotify, so to say they disappeared into obscurity after winning days just isn't accurate. Craig told the Music Network in 2011 that he doesn't have any regrets about how things panned out. I think if anything, we've done really well. Not many Australian bands in the last 10, 15 years have done what we've done. You can probably count them on one hand. There's no regrets. In 2018, Craig even made a surprise appearance with the Killers when they performed in Sydney. Addressing the crowd during the band's encore, frontman Brandon Flowers credited the Vines as one of the bands that kick-started rock music again. They played Get Free together. He said, they just sort of blew the doors open and allowed for bands like us to walk through them. Craig even got the highly evolved lineup back together for a couple of shows in Australia that year. Late in 2023, there were teasers on Instagram that they were back in the studio. And at the height of the hype in 2002, the enemy published a slightly cringeworthy article called Anatomy of a Rock God that singled out Craig's body parts like he was some sort of deity or pharaoh of indie music. The coverage of the vines in them days and of Craig's mental health struggles belong in a different era. The Vines were just a band, and Craig Nichols is only a human being, and perhaps things are better that way. <laughs>